Uh, good afternoon. I'm Chris Knopf, the Executive Director of Friends of the Boundary Waters Wilderness. And, and we have a great, great program this afternoon with uh, Dan Pauley, who will talk about winter camping. And and, and Dan is truly a, a renaissance man. He's uh, he's an author of a, a leading guidebook into the Boundary Waters. He's a map maker. He makes these Voyager maps here that we have here. You can see these. It's uh, uh, a great a great map in the Boundary Waters. Uh, and he served on the board of Friends of the Boundary Waters Wilderness and is an uh, all-around great guy and a source of incredible information about the Boundary Waters. So we at Friends of the Boundary Waters Wilderness have been protecting and connecting people to the Boundary Waters for, for nearly 50 years. And, and with uh, people such as yourselves, we'll be able to do that for another, another 50 years here. So uh, our Lunch with the Friends program is a way of connecting with all of you with topics that are important to the Boundary Waters and help us enjoy and understand and inspire us to protect the Boundary Waters. So thank you, Dan. We're on Pearl Harbor Day here, December 7th here. Uh, it's a very warm day uh, here in the Twin Cities, but that uh, encourages us uh, to appreciate the, the, the beautiful winter season all the more. So Thank you, Dan, for doing this, and thank you for everyone out there for your love and support of protecting the Boundary Waters. Take it away, Dan. Good. Uh, well, thank you for that introduction, Chris. Uh, we got a lot of great things to cover today. I might be sipping a little uh, tea with honey at different points because my voice is a little coarse today. Uh, so we're going to go for a, over a whole bunch of things. I will point out with just this first slide, something that uh, is remarkable about winter camping in the Boundary Waters is the stars. Uh, you may know that it's a protected uh, uh, dark sky area now, uh, designated maybe the better term than protected. Uh, parts of it would be protected. But uh, one of the great things about being up there is the night sky. I mean, northern lights, but even if it's not northern lights, uh, to be out on a silent lake, uh, nobody around, snow, the trees, and the stars. I mean, it's it's really something. So um, it's a good capture of that, of, of what you can see up there. So um, this is just the introductory slide and what we're gonna talk about today, uh, a little background about why I like going up in the winter. I've been up many times uh, in the winter and uh, very cold, more moderate and done all kinds of like tents and snowshoes and skis. So we're gonna go over a lot of that. I'll give you some of my recommendations. Uh, we're gonna talk about transportation and shelter. I think those are probably the two biggest things to think about. Um, yeah, especially shelter. You know, that's the thing people are concerned about. Are they going to be really cold at night? And how how do they stay warm? And that comes down to shelter uh, uh, besides, you know, the right clothing. And then I'll, I'll give you some thoughts on route considerations and navigation and then leave no trace principles and safety. Uh, the safety is super important. It's very, you can go up in the winter and it's very safe, but there's a couple of recommendations I have. And then uh, one thing we're going to get to at the end, we're going to be going over gear, obviously, uh, quite a bit. And you'd be like, wow, this looks really expensive. And some of the gear is expensive, but um, most is rentable. In fact, I think all of it's rentable. So it doesn't have to be prohibitively expensive, um, especially if you're just trying it out. So we're going to go through all that stuff um, and let's get right into it. So the one thing I love about the Bounty Waters in winter, and I do a lot of summer, but arguably I even like the winter more. I, I really do. It's, it's some of my best memories. It's so beautiful. So uh, this picture on the left is heading over to a lake called Snowbank Lake, where there's actually not a portage, um, but it's coming near Brant Lake. If you've been over on the Gunflint Trail, Round Lake, Tuscarora Outfitters, it's that area. So this was snowshoeing up there a few years ago, and we went to Blue Snow Lake, um, and there was this frost on the trees. I think this is most of the, at this point, an alder, and um, these, I think, or some of these are um, uh, larch uh, trees, uh, and so you know, um, you get these beautiful ice formations, whether it's on the trees or in the lake and the water, whatever it might be. So great ice and snow, really, really beautiful. Uh, you know, here's another example. I think this on the left is actually, this might be over by Angleworm Lake. That's my son and nephew a, a couple of years ago. Uh, and so you get the rocks and you get the water, you know, the ice drips off of it and stuff like that. And it's just something else. Here on the right, I think that was over by Snowbank Lake, hiking again through a swamp or a marsh that you're just not going to go through in the winter. You can't in the summer. You can't, um, and so all that kind of stuff is just is so beautiful. Uh, one thing is, uh, I've seen more wildlife probably in the winter. On the left is you can see a, a somewhat camouflaged snowshoe hare. 
Uh, you can see the eyeball there, beautiful little rabbit. Uh, and then on the right, uh, something that I see a lot up there is that's a track for, I'll let you look at that. That's about maybe eight inches wide. And you think, what is that a track of? And uh, I'll give you a second, but that is a track of an otter. So otters kind of slide and push their way through the snow. And they seem to cover a lot of miles because I've followed a lot of otter tracks that go and go and go. And occasionally I've seen otters up there um, in the winter, which is pretty neat. So wildlife tracks uh, are always exciting to see up there. Um, maybe none more exciting than if you see wolf tracks. And um, what I have here is from a couple different times we saw wolves or their tracks. And on the left, uh, this is this is years ago now, but we were up on the east side of Three Mile Island, which is on Seagull Lake, big lake on the edge of the Boundary Waters at the at Gunflint uh, end of the Gunflint Trail. And uh, to keep the story short, two wolves killed a deer right like maybe fifty yards from us, um, and they had chased it. We noticed later they had those wolves had chased that deer through the snow in this big bay for maybe you know i don't know an hour or something and the wolves you could tell by the tracks like one wolf would chase the deer while the other one sort of laid back and then uh they sort of went back and forth i mean they're a, such a sophisticated predator and so smart and um we have a video of it that's kind of grainy that's on youtube we have a video and so that that was pretty amazing to see that um but we've had times where we've gone out crossed over wolf tracks that looked fresh went for like a day hike and then came back. And those same, I assume the same wolves since they're territorial had crossed over our tracks and then we crossed their tracks again. So we never saw those wolves. They they no doubt knew we were out there, at least smelled us and they may have seen us. I don't know, but uh, that's the kind of stuff you see. I've also seen um, very interesting like bird of prey attack, you know, evidence of them trying to catch like say a squirrel in the snow and you see the feathers and not the feathers, well, You'll see like uh, their feathers, the hawk or owl, maybe making tracks in the snow with their feathers. So a lot of wildlife sightings, actually. And if you don't see the actual animal, you see the tracks, which is pretty cool. Uh, another thing you sometimes see, if you look for it, you'll see stuff in regards to like human, maybe we could maybe call them historic signs or artifacts uh, that you don't really see in the in the summer because they're covered up. Uh, and this is an example over by Angleworm Lake which is off the Echo Trail, sort of west of Ely. Um, and they used to, on some of these campsites, have campsite markers. And so this was a campsite marker. And I don't know if this is uh, 60, 70 years old, but it's still there. It's some, sort of remarkable. This is just not that many years ago. Uh, or on that same trail, you can find up in the like trees, there are a few of those gl of glass resistors, like those blue glass that would have been used for a phone line because there was a fire tower out there and some of them are still up. Some of those things are still there. Um, and are actually, I think, considered a protected artifact. They will, in time, pass away and fall off and degrade. But you'll see some of that stuff. And I think that's pretty interesting to capture all those things. So um, that uh, is a, th those are examples of some of the stuff I love going up there to see. Uh, I've been up uh, in all kinds of weather. This is, uh, again, I think this is the south side of Seagull Lake. And you'll see that it was 40 below. In fact, I knew it was going to be super cold that day. And so I brought this thermometer along from like uh, Home Depot or something because I wanted like to prove that it wasn't electronic. This was the actual 40 below temperature. So that was remarkable. Um, and as I'm going to talk about gear, we were totally cozy and totally warm. I mean, I have a lot of frost on my, my head here, but we were very comfortable that night. And so it was a great trip. Um, and to stay comfortable and have a great trip, uh, a lot of it comes down to transportation. Uh, and then we're going to talk about shelter. So when you're thinking about transportation up in the Boundary Waters, we're obviously talking human powered. I guess you could go with sled dogs. I don't have sled dogs. And so people do that. And we, that would be, I'm, I'm sure the friends could have a presentation on, you know, where you can say, uh, have a, a group that take you out with sled dogs. But that is not what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about you're going on your own. And you're going to think about skiing versus snowshoeing versus sledding options uh, and sled in terms of hauling your gear. Now, um, I have it in a different order here, but I have done it all in that regard. And I now just go with snowshoes uh, because it's easier in terms of uh, getting up and down like hills. 
and you can get good traction. It works great in deep powder. You can have warm boots um, that you don't normally have with this, a, a cross country ski, even more like a mountaineering ski. So what I, what I use, this is, you know, picture from one of our trips is we just use your classic modern snowshoe. And there's a lot of those that work great. You can rent those, but that's a great way to go. Um, you can see a couple of shots here um, in terms of like uh, hauling our gear. This on the left is heading over to John A. Paulson Lake, J.A.P. Paul, sometimes called Paulson Lake now. Um, and uh, that's a few years ago after the blowdown. Uh, and what I usually do in this in this time, the, the guy on the right uh, of the left picture, he's not even got his snowshoes on at this point because the snow uh, wasn't that deep. And that's pretty hilly. But what I usually do in terms of pulling my gear uh, is we'll use pretty inexpensive, generally these pretty expensive, inexpensive sleds that you could get at like a fleet farm or other place. Maybe um, uh, a big hardware store might have those. You can get them at quite a few places, but that's maybe a $35, $40 sled that then we'll attach a rope to. And there's holes usually in there, or you could drill holes that then we'll put either bungees through or tie, you know, I sometimes like to string a little rope through there and then attach to that. Um, and I'll put my stuff in a duffel bag. Uh, this is much better than the alternative of hauling this stuff on your back because you're just pulling it along and you're not having to lift it. But if you have it on your back, say with a backpacking backpack, uh, it gets pretty tiring because it's like walking on sand or beach or snow, obviously. And so it's tiring. Like you can't carry that much weight on your back without being exhausted. And so you'll maybe have a few things on your back, but then you'll have heavier stuff in a sled. I also have, I don't, it's not in these pictures. I think there's one in a different picture. There's, a, there's people who make kind of classic toboggans, which are like a, just a long, thin, roll, rolls up piece of like heavy duty, like uh, resin, like plastic. I, I have one, I think it's from Black River toboggans or sleds, but um, those are great. They can be quite long. They could be like 10 feet long and they're flexible. And then you have, you just put your duffel bags on those and tie them in. That's actually, they're really good. Um, if you're mostly on flat water where you're not going up and down uh, a lot of hills like flat ice, uh, if you have to snake through the portages, it's not quite as good. Um, although they work quite good if you're going over big lakes, they're excellent actually. So that's another, I don't have a picture of that, but that'd be a toboggan approach. And I do that. Um, the photo on the right here is what we would call a pulk, um, which people use. And that's a custom, you know, winter camping design that people use for a lot of stuff actually for like expeditions and stuff it's it's the shell with a soft in liner that you throw your stuff in oftentimes people will have like a waist poles like this person does um that's jason long actually and uh those those work good too um the poles actually generally aren't that necessary in the boundary waters though because uh you can you're just going along the lake so i we usually just use straps and then um, when you're going down a hill, oftentimes you want the load in front of you, say on a portage where you can kind of, you know, steer it and you don't have it pushing against you. So some people prefer this. I actually totally comfortable going with a cheap $40 sled, throw some duffel bags in time down works great, but you can do something more fancy if you want. Um, I, I'm going to just go back here. I, I don't have a slide on cross country skis cause that's not what I do. Uh, but you, but I've done it before. You can see the person here on the on the right does use cross country skis. Again, they work. Um, it's not my preference for the reasons I said. They're not as you know easy to navigate through, like say a portage. Um, and I've had them. They kind of build up ice more, in from my experience, than the snowshoes I've had. Or at least the snowshoes are clean, easier to clean off. But people can do cross country skiing. Uh, but again, you'd want kind of a heavier duty ski if that's what you did. So snowshoes, inexpensive sled, and you're going to be good. You can haul your gear out there because um, you're going to have more gear than you would in the summer, um, at least relative to the backpacking. And one of the big things that's going to add weight to a, a typical trip is going to be your shelter. All right. And so what I want to talk about today in terms of shelter is what are your options uh, and what are some of the benefits and disadvantages? All right. So uh, I'm going to start with really the simplest of all designs uh, that doesn't really weigh anything, uh, but is a little bit complicated to make. And that would be a Quincy. All right. And so a Quincy 
you know, it's not really what one would call an igloo, but it's a, a, a snow shelter that is made by piling up snow. So you have to have enough snow. Like right now, there's not enough snow in the Boundary Waters. There's almost none. Uh, but you pile up snow, maybe the size of a like an automobile. Generally, what you do is you stick little sticks in there to like, say, foot long sticks. Um, so you know where the outside is. And then you carve it from the inside after letting it sit for say an hour or two uh maybe two hours you want it to harden up and these are awesome i mean they're an incredible shelter for like emergencies but also they're just they 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 are sort of counterintuitively warm they're they're a very cozy way to sleep and so you can see here um we carved out this quincy uh you can see on the left uh someone's on the outside of it um, or inside actually as he's coming out and then the right you can see actually the next morning there's a person standing on the top they get they get like rock hard like you could you can have walls that are say nine inches thick and you'd have trouble breaking them down like you could jump on that thing uh but inside um you carve it open you'd have a a, a breather hole you want to have that just to get some fresh air in there um and uh you would just sleep like on a sleeping pad like this is an extremely, you know, low impact, very easy to make kind of uh, shelter. The disadvantage besides needing to have enough snow is that you're going to, um, you know, you're, you're going to spend a few hours making it, right? So you'd want to start that thing by noon, for example, if you're going to sleep in it at night, because you pile up the snow, you've got to let it sit for an hour or two, maybe you go like hiking, and then you got to come back and hollow it out. So it's it's sort of labor intensive, um, but you'll, you're, they're really tremendous. And you can refine the design where you kind of have shelves in there so you sleep above the bottom, but it's it's great. If you haven't built this before, it's, it's a nice thing to try. You can try it outside of the wilderness as well and see how it works for you. But also, um, you know, you could bring a tent along and then build this to see how that works. But uh, they're great. So th that's a Quincy. That's your lightest weight and essentially least expensive way of doing it. Um, the the second way is to use your sort of three season tent or maybe even a four season tent, which they're not as common today. But you know, this is um, a trip where uh, I think this this is off the Gunflint Trail, actually north near like Duncan Lake. Um, and the person I was with brought their summer tent. And then they put the canopy on, which is not in here, the tarp, the rainfly. But uh, it actually can work great, right? The disadvantage of this, so it's it's light, um, but you have you're just not going to be you're going to be the same temperature as the outside. Um, and so something like this uh, is excellent if it's not too cold. You're going to want a very warm sleeping bag, probably. Uh, and the disadvantage a disadvantage is it's difficult to do for like more than two nights because you don't have a way to dry out your gear that's that's almost the biggest issue you're perspiring you're sweating your boot liners get cold they, or they get wet and then the next morning everything's like you know 20 below if it's that the temperature and it's hard to it's hard to get your boots in and in your feet and your boots and all that so so this is good like you know, if you if you haven't been in the boundary waters and you want to like hey i would like to go i don't want to get any gear i've got a summer tent this would be something you could try in March, for example. It's not as cold. Uh, so, uh, or you're going to go for one night. If you go for one night, this can be excellent if you have a very warm sleeping bag. Uh, but three, four nights, not the, not that great for, for somebody who wants to be comfortable. Um, the other thing we're going to get to in a second is more of a heated tent. And the benefit of those we're going to talk about is sort of the communal aspect. Because with a tent like this at, you know, five o'clock it's dark out you maybe have your dinner and then what are you going to do you're cold and you kind of like might just go off to sleep and so it doesn't have that social aspect would be another component but totally works and you it's gear you probably already have if you're if you're a, a camper um uh, the next step up in terms of weight and comfort is this uh in my opinion and this is a tent uh it's called a pyramid tent um and this one is made by a company called Seek Outside. Uh, so this is this is my tent. They make a variety of tents, but pyramid tents are usually have a center pole as this one does. 
and this is now looking inside of it. I'll go back again, but you can see it's it, it it's anchored actually in the corners and the side with these orange, there's orange lines. Um, and uh, it ends up being a center pole, which is this black portion right here, this black pole. And then the sides are anchored down. That tent with a pole is maybe only gonna be like eight pounds, maybe a little bit less. And you can sleep four people in it just fine. Um, and so it's dynamite, it's a, good, it's a good tent. Now what's nice about it is that same company in this case makes um, a little titanium stove uh, that comes apart and they make a few of them, a few different like models. But this is a titanium stove that will fold down and weighs like four pounds and folds down like into like a, a little book bag type thing. Um, even the even the flue is is that's all titanium and that rolls up. So very lightweight at night if you're in this tent. And I was with, with this tent actually in this stove last year with with Chris, the director of the Friends executive director and uh you build your fire you cook your meal on this and it's it's pretty comfortable actually you could be relatively warm uh in this and because you got a source of heat and you still have a kit that's maybe 15 pounds um and you lay your sleeping bags down and maybe a ground cloth really a nice way to winter camp actually um pretty lightweight uh now this is a nylon tent or a side nylon with a pretty light stove. Um, it's good, you're warm, and you can cover a lot of miles with that thing if that was your goal, okay? But if you wanted to be the coziest of cozy in the Boundary Waters, this is what you would use. And this is a, a hot tent. This one is actually made by a company called Snow Trekker. That's their little logo you can kind of see in there. They used to be called Empire Canvas. So I have one of their old tents. Uh, this, is, this is from their website. Uh, but they're a pretty well-known company in terms of making winter camping tents. And it's a canvas tent. And unlike the tent I just showed you by Seek Outside, they have sort of a sawhorse design. So there's, you know, it's an A-frame, but there's across the top, uh, aluminum post, and then four posts that come down. And then you lay the tent on top of that. So it it's self-supporting without like guy lines, but you usually put in guy lines to stretch it out and make it bigger inside. And then you have a stove in there, a wood burning stove, uh, which we'll talk about. And this is this is like a cabin in the woods. Um, it's canvas, so it breathes, and you don't get like condensation, which you kind of get with the last tent I showed you. Um, and uh, we'll go into this interior. I've got some pictures, but um, it's really nice in terms of like being able to enjoy the the wilderness, if you want to call it that, or the, the winter wilderness and. These are rentable. We're going to talk about the end. You can rent these things, uh, but heavy. Like the stove in the tent could weigh, you know, it depends on what you've got. That could be 60 pounds, but in a sled, that's not so bad. Um, here's, here's this is my tent. Um, as my old one. They used to have these sort of flip up doors uh, and light inside there. We cut some firewood. It was, it was great. Um, this is my son who's quite a bit older now. But, you know, you're, you're cooking. We brought little portable chairs along. It's got a heavy-duty tarp that you put at the bottom. Uh, and then, you know, we're making blueberry pancakes right on the stove. He's got his little feet warmed up in those uh, little uh, booties and stuff. So you can have a great time cooking incredible food. Uh, and you can, um, you know, you have a lights hanging in there. It's it's just really, you know, very comfortable here he is uh, sleeping right with a, he, that's an overkill for a sleeping bag, to be honest. But with a kid, something to think about if you go up with your kids, I, I would make the kid trip your second trip. So you get the bugs worked out. But if you want to go with your kids, they, you know, they don't, they produce a lot of heat, but they're small. So you want an overly warm sleeping bag for your, for, for a child if they're up there. Um, and so in this case, he's got a very, very warm down sleeping bag that I, I take on other trips, um, but very comfortable. Uh, and, uh, let me see here. I, I got a couple, I don't have too many pictures, but I don't know if I have a picture of the stove. I don't have a good picture of the stove here, but that uses a stove. That's a bigger version of the one I showed you effectively from the seek outside tent. And those stoves are made by a number of companies. Maybe the best, um, I think he's still making them is four dog stove that makes a titanium one. That's like 15 pounds, but they also make a non titanium one and, and other companies do too. Um, that are really quite good, but they're considerably heavier. Uh, but on a sled, none of them are prohibitive in terms of weight. So 
Uh, and we cook our food right on there, boil water, all that stuff. It's, it's, it's great. Um, and uh, one thing you do have to be careful about, uh, this is a pair of my uh, Sorel liners that, you know, sat next to the stove too long and they burned the bottom off, uh, which unfortunately today are hard to find replacements. I don't know why that is, but um, I had to buy new boots. I could not get replacements. Uh, but uh, one of the things, you, you know, you want to avoid having your stuff burnt up, but uh, you also get the chance to dry your gear out. And you could go up for a month, two months, three months with this kind of gear because you hang up your stuff to dry. And, you know, within an hour or two with that nice hot wood burning uh, fire stove, your stuff dries out, you pack it away the next morning, your fleece, your boot liners, if they haven't got a hole burn in them, are perfect, right? They're nice and dry and you can have a great time. Um, so that's kind of the, that, that would be, and I'm going to go back to, like, that is really... If you're looking for comfort, that's the way to go. And you can have an incredible time. And there are places that rent those. And I'll talk about that at the end. That's a great, great way to enjoy the Bounty Waters in winter. But all, all these are good. They're just different techniques. Um, the last one, if you really want to go light, I have a friend who likes to go up. I think he's even watching today. But he likes to use a hammock. And so you can like uh, hang in your hammock. And so you're off the cold ground. I haven't done this. Uh, but the technology's gotten along, gone a long ways with the different kinds of ways to stay warm. So I know people who swear by that. And some people, ultralight, will just go with a bivy, which is, you know, a, a, a liner, not a liner, but an outer shell for your sleeping bag. And you can just sleep in that thing. Um, and I know people have done that too. I, I, I would find it claustrophobic. So I don't prefer that. Uh, but some people do. So those are kind of some of your camping type options in terms of uh, where you're going to stay for tents. Now, let's talk a little bit. So you've got your transportation figured out. You know you're going to go in with whatever sort of tent. You've got that figured out. Now, what are some of your considerations for entry points? Uh, this is, I know it's going to be small on your screen, but here's an overview of all the Boundary Water entry points. The whole Boundary Waters is open in the winter, right? You can go anywhere you want. Um, now, permits are self-issued at the entry point. No reservations necessary, but you do have to go in at an entry point. Um, and they always have a little like uh, sign with a place where you can fill out your permit. Uh, and you fill it out and you you save your copy and then you put it in there. So uh, no permits necessary. You don't have to print anything off the computer. None of that sort of stuff. You don't have to stop at the ranger station, but you do have to get a permit. You have to fill it out on site. Um, I think it's, you know, in terms of terrain, I think lake routes are better than rivers just for the obvious safety reason that moving water is not does not produce great ice. Uh, and so if you look at this map, we'll talk about this, but the the western boundary waters, the Echo Trail, like you can see here, like like, like getting up the um, the Little Indian River Sioux North and stuff like that, that's usually you're going to go up like small streams to get to the lakes. And so I don't really winter camp much on the far west over there. Um, but you can do that. And we'll talk about some more different options, but the thing you do have to keep in mind, uh, is that make sure the access roads are going to be plowed. And, uh, if there's say cabins on, if you're on a lake where there's cabins, like on the edge of the boundary waters, like Seagull Lake, that the entry point there at the end of the gunflint, that parking lot and all that's always plowed pretty quickly after a snowstorm for various reasons. Some people go into Seagull ice fishing, for example, um, or if there's a resort on that lake, it's going to likely be plowed. But if it, if there's no reason for activity, say some some of the points down by like Brule Lake on the southeast part of the Boundary Waters, those tr those roads are not typically plowed uh, in the winter unless there's maybe outside of the Boundary Waters it could be logging activity. So then it might be plowed. Um, so you have to keep that in mind. And if you're not sure, you should call the ranger station, the Forest Service ranger station. Um, or the general forest service, you could call them too. But they would know what the status is if there's something going on. Um, but the Gunflin Trail is all plowed. Uh, and the access points are generally plowed off the Gunflint. Uh, like Sawbill Lake, there's an outfitter there. That's going to be plowed. Snowbank Lake, that's going to be plowed right up to the entry point and stuff like that. Um, and then uh, I'll, we'll talk a little bit about navigation in terms of location. It's kind of easier in some ways. Um, 
uh, because you know you, uh, you you're you, you know you're you're just you're just on these frozen lakes and you're not in some ways it's easier but the problem i was going to point out is that it can be a little harder to find campsites and harder to find portages because they're all covered in snow uh and so i got some ideas on that too um and actually i'm going to go back here because i want to point out something this is not a mining discussion but if you can see this is the back of a voyager all voyager maps have this common map but the pink stuff is the lakes that are downstream of the proposed twin metals mine and you can see it would just gut the boundary waters if there was and there will be leak there, that thing's going to leak but there could be a cataclysmic leak and so i just point out like that's why the friends is is opposed to this for various reasons but it's the core of the boundary waters is downstream of a copper nickel mine would be would not be good so here's an example off the fernberg road uh this slide doesn't look that great on my screen but snowbake lake is excellent you can go all over snowbake now the part um to the lower left that allows like snowmobiles so you know you wouldn't want to um if you want to be away from that you want to go further into the east or north um and then you got like moose lake which you can go up all the way up to prairie portage um so different options there i've done both of those areas in the winter they're they're really nice um the sun, central gunflint trail and really all the gunflint trail is great but uh an examples here would be you can go up to like duncan lake and over to South Lake or Dunn Lake, Partridge Lake. I've done all of that. You've got the stairway portage off of Duncan Lake. So there's a lot of good options off the gunplant, to be quite honest. And then if you were to snow, if you were to be a cross country skier, you bring your skis along in green here, they have all these great cross country ski trails you can go down. Now, you, you don't want to pull your sled down those because those are maintained trails, but like you could camp, and I've done this camp uh, on one of those lakes, and then you can uh, take cross-country skis and and do a day of cross-country skiing if you wanted so that that's a pretty nice way of doing things um and then same thing the upper gunflint trail was probably where i've spent the most time seagull like i don't know if you can see my pointer but like right here is where the wolves were but i've been down to gabby michigami and gillis and tuscarora just all those areas are, are really really nice in the winter the whole boundary waters is but this area is good because there's not a lot of moving water relatively speaking now, I was mentioning navigation. You're going to need hard copy maps just like summer. Like you cannot just rely on a GPS or a phone. Um, you might want to consider supplementing with some sort of digital map and a, a good option. Uh, so because you want to be able to track, you know, if you can track your location and also see where like the portages are, because uh, they're going to be easier to go across than just like, you know, trying to go through the woods. And so I, I point out here that at no cost, you can go to get the Avenza map, which is a mapping software, and you can download free uh, GPS maps, essentially, of the boundary waters. Yeah, every Voyager map has a simplified version. You can download for free. Um, it doesn't have all the information, but it has the, a lot of great stuff. But they work great with a paper map. But then you can, this shows you can track your route and record that and share it with people and stuff, too. So um it's a it, you know that that helps with with navigation and sort of finding some of those snow covered places um now and then you know we've gone actually pretty quick so we might be able to ask answer some questions but uh i have some uh leave no trace and safety things i wanted to point out uh the first one was in terms of leave no trace now wood collection uh you can get to places you wouldn't normally get in the summer and so wood collection uh I really recommend that when you're cutting wood, you know, it has to be dead and down. And the Forest Service would tell you, and I think basically really should be away from the water. But what people sometimes do is they'll go along the shore of a lake and just cut off, say, the end of a dead tree. Okay. Well, that creates, that leaves that cut that, you know, could be there for many, many, many years. Um, and it creates less of a wilderness feel. So I really recommend uh, not doing that, not leaving like an obvious cut where other people are going to see it on the side of a lake. Um, I didn't always practice that years ago. I just didn't think about that. And, but now it's, it's a priority not to, not to do that. Um, and then you should leave, you know, any human waste it should be 20, 200 feet away from camps um, and portages and water. Uh, you could pack it out too. Um, but, or you can use the latrines at a campsite. The forest service, they don't have an official policy about where you camp. They kind of recommend, they do recommend not at campsites, but I've often felt 
that a campsite, if it's if you're if you're good there, it actually is less of an impact than just camping out like somewhere else in the woods. And also sometimes it's pretty pretty difficult to camp on the lake itself. Um, and most people don't uh, because you end up getting water like from cracks in the ice coming up. So it's it's usually not that great to camp on the water itself. But again, wood collecting, do it in a fashion that people aren't going to see, you know, you're that you cut part of a, a tree that's visible from the shore and then human waste away from camp. Um, and then I think what I'd call a pretty, pretty important safety thing is, you know, you always want to be careful with open water. Uh, this is a picture down by Tuscarora, uh, west of southwest of Tuscarora, actually Tuscarora Lake, where um, we came through a, a patch of some really pretty shallow, well, shallow water, but thin ice and open water. And uh, we skirted the edge on the left here. You can see that's my son in the background. And the water was very, very shallow there. So we did not fear too much that we would break through. And if we did, it was very shallow. But uh, there always is a possibility you're going to break through someplace. And you got to be prepared for that. And so the one thing I always bring now, and I have two of them, is I got a, a shot here. I think I pictured one, but it's 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 like a throw bag for like water rescues. And so here here's that same bag here. And so what this is is uh, like a, a a sack with a cord in it that will flow out very easily. Like you you toss this part and you hang hang on to the other piece, and you can throw this. You know, I think it's a fifty foot rope, or, but you know maybe it's twenty five actually. But it's enough that if someone fell in the water. Uh, you can throw that to them. They grab on and you can pull them out. Um, and so I always have two of those along uh, because the person who falls in could be the person who has it with them and they should just have it clipped onto their backpack or clipped on that they can reach it. So whoever falls in, there should be somebody else in your party who can throw that to them. They grab on, pull them out. Then you're going to have to get them dry and warm and all that. But that's much better than the alternative of, you know, trying to scrounge for a branch or something. And if the ice is thin, you shouldn't go out to them. So this is what I use. They're like $27. I think I, I got another one coming here uh, from Amazon, but I'd bring two of those along. That's probably maybe the most important safety feature you could have with you. I've never fallen through the ice, but you got to be prepared for that. Just like you always have to have your PFD on when you're winter, uh, when you're summer camping, in my opinion, if you're in a canoe. Uh, and the other thing I, I often will bring is ice picks. Like you can get these a little like on a on a cord, little ice picks that you could help get out of the lake. Um, and I, I usually have those along too, but I actually think the throw rope is, is gonna be a better way of getting out because somebody can pull you out. Um, this last slide, I'm gonna go back to it. Uh, you can see this was, this is that toboggan on the lower left that I was mentioning. Like things are not really that, tied into that well in this picture but it's it's this black toboggan there's a little red rope or orange rope that drags behind it that's i think black river is the company who made that it's actually pretty nice but it's another way of doing it you could go to their website um and then i think i'm going to open up the oh i got i gotta I have a slide about gear rental so we went over a lot of stuff and it, you might be like well it's kind of expensive i bet and some of it is expensive like the, the those snow trucker tents and stove over a thousand dollars for sure. The combo might be two thousand dollars, so comparable or maybe a little less than a, a canoe, um, ultralight canoe. But uh, that's expensive, right? So you can rent those both in Ely and off of Highway sixty one. There's places that will rent those tents, uh, and about fifty bucks a day. So again, similar to a canoe, and uh, way less expensive than a hotel. So, you know, you can try it out. That's how I got started is renting my gear, found out I liked it, and now I, you know, have bought my own. Uh, and then snowshoes, cross country ski, sleds, winter sleeping bags, those can be rented too. Uh, you know, we didn't spend a lot of time, maybe hardly any, about sleeping bags, but since I think we've got a little time, and we're, we're going to have time for questions. But I'll tell you what I do for sleeping bags and sleeping pads. Uh, a very good sleeping pad is, a pad is important. Uh, and there's a few of those I've used, uh, XPED sort of downfilled ones a lot. I like those. They, they blow up, they get inflated, but now like Thermarest has some good ones that are lighter weight. So a good sleeping pad is important, um, because you're going to conduct a lot of your heat out through the, 
contact with the snow or the or the ice or the ground. And then, um, you know, a warm sleeping bag is pretty important uh, in all these scenarios, but less important if you have the hot tent because you can keep that fire going all night long and also it dries out. So if if you don't have an expensive sleeping bag and, and you don't have to get one, a, a good thing is to use two bags. You know, you can double them up or use one as sort of a blanket. Um, so that that works very well. And and if you're concerned there, like a, a double sleeping bag can definitely work with a good sleeping pad. Um, otherwise, you know, you can you can over time acquire a, a better sleeping bag if that's what you needed. Uh, and I'm actually going to show you one more thing because we're going to, Chris, and we're going to answer some questions. I see some questions in the chat. I'll try to open that up. But one thing I'm thinking of doing since we have a couple of minutes, I'm going to go up in about a week and a half. I hope to go to the Boundary Waters uh, with my son who's coming home from a college break. And uh, we like to kind of cover a little distance. Sometimes I sometimes I base camp, I go trout fishing or just day hike. And those are great. But we like to kind of cover some distance. Uh, and so what we're going to do is take that green tent, uh, the uh, seek outside tent, and we're going to probably try to set up on lakes. Uh, and uh, what we'll end up doing is you have to anchor it. And I'm going to anchor it with something like this. This is an ice anchor that you'd use for ice climbing. And so we have to anchor the four corners. Uh, and But we could go really light and without much ice, or without much snow, we might really be able to move. So that's going to be interesting. I, I was telling um, Chris earlier that maybe in January, we could do another presentation that really focuses on gear. And I could bring like my, my different stoves and stuff over to the friend's office. And we could kind of do more an interactive thing um, where I could show you some of the stuff and I can report back if this worked for me. Hopefully it will. Uh, it, and we'll find out, but I could show you like augers that I use and stuff like that. Uh, it, it might be good if, if people are interested. And if we did it in January, there's still time to do it this winter. Um, but I'm going to go down here. I'm going to open up chat. Um, and I'm going to go down these. And Chris, if you have questions that you've read in the chat, you could go ahead and ask them. Sure. Thank, thank you so so much, Dan. And thank you, everyone, for putting some uh some questions in the, the chat function there. You know, maybe one thing to talk about, Dan, you, you alluded to it just a moment ago, but but getting water. How do you how do you get water? Why don't you talk a little bit about yeah. what you do for that? Sure. So, you know, uh, a waste, a lot of people get water as they melt snow. Uh, and I don't do that anymore, and I'll tell you why. But if you want to melt snow, you can melt it right on your, you know, you could have a stove along, like a little, even a jet boil or something. You can have a stove along. Um, and melted, but it takes a lot of energy. If you remember your well, high school chemistry class, it takes a lot of energy to melt snow. And so if you're burning fuel, uh, say from a canned, like a, you know, uh, white gas or something, it takes a lot. Um, or even on your stove, if you throw it on your stove in a pot, it takes a lot of energy. It slows, it, you'll notice the, the stove will kick out a lot less heat. But the other thing is you end up with a surprising amount of like wood chips and like embers and not embers, I guess, but just little like pieces of bark and stuff in there, even if it doesn't look like it would be. So that works, but you need a lot of water. And so what I use, you know, it's, it's cold, you're sweating, low humidity. So what I do, um, if I'm not doing that, and, I, and that, that would be a backup. Melting snow is my backup. My preferred way is I'll bring a lightweight auger along um, drill a hole in the ice and scoop it out. And then I, I filter it or use um, a SteriPen. I'll often use a SteriPen. I don't know if that's entirely necessary, um, but I think it's a good idea. You don't want to get, you know, Giardia or something. So I'll dig a hole, scoop out water, put it into a liter bottle. And then I would typically use a SteriPen. Um, but I've also brought along um, water filters, especially the, the fiber filters, like the old, or this will make them like the... Um, uh, I can't think of the brand now, but you know, um, uh, some of the, some of the common water filters were great, but the lines can clog up. And, and so if you're in a tent, it's not as big of an issue. But one other thing to note is a lot of the more modern, like water filters are like a hollow, hollow, hollow membrane. And those are actually not meant to freeze often. The North, not North face, but, um, uh, uh, I, the, the name slips me out, come back to me, but um, some of them can. So there's some relatively expensive ones 
that uh, can freeze, but generally they're not supposed to freeze. So you you wouldn't want to like have it freeze and realize it's not working any longer. Um, so SteriPen works, or you could boil the water too if you're cooking with it or something like that, or you could use tablets. Tablets would probably work great, but I definitely prefer to get my water out of the lake and do that as opposed to melting it. Long answer, but there's a lot to it. So lightweight hand auger, get the water from the lake that way and, and yeah. put it in your, your Nalgene and, and use yeah. a SteriPen or whatever. Yeah. Great. And then, you know, there's, you talked about the, the, the challenges sort of moisture intense and how the canvas tent breathe, but, but your uh, seek outside one doesn't breathe quite as much. There's a question here about uh, a vapor barrier and sleeping bags. And mm -hmm. why don't you talk about the, the challenge of moisture in a sleeping bag and, and, and what you do? Yeah. So moisture is maybe the unexpected challenge that people have in the winter, right? Like it just, it really, really is. Um, now, uh, like the seek outside, I, I, I mentioned in this, this viewer said the same thing, like that could be an issue because um, you're releasing a lot of moisture and it'll build up on the inside of the tent and it can crunch, like it kind of flakes off and then you're sleeping and you get these little flakes coming down of snow and kind of keeps you awake potentially. Uh, so you can, for example, put up, they do have a liner. The tent I showed does have a, a liner that I sometimes put in there that, that avoids that. It keeps it just a little warmer on the inside wall. But um, in terms of your sleeping bag, yeah, you know, uh, ideally that sleeping bag is breathing and like they have, some of them have, like I have some marmot bags that are meant to be like, like kind of a little bit like repel water that falls in them, but it should be breathable. Um, but that's, I think one of the issues with um, the bivy sacks is like, you can like sometimes build up a lot of moisture in there. And then once it gets cold, say the next day, it becomes like, it becomes ice in there and it's, it's very cold. So I don't know if there's, and maybe the the person who gave the comment has some idea, like you might be able to, if there's a vapor barrier that you sleep inside, I'm not sure about that, but then somewhere the moisture has to go someplace. And so if it's, if it, if it's kept close to you, that would be a problem, I think too. Does that answer the question, Chris, or what was the? Yeah, uh, some interesting uh, chat comments about various liners that people are using to within their sleeping bags as a way of trying to deal with that that moisture issue and it yeah um you know it it, it is obviously a, a big big issue it's sort of that that hidden challenge of, of winter camping you know there's on, on the issue of sleeping bag I, I know this has been a, a discussion among some of the folks we've gone winter camping with uh, is is you know how many layers to put in? I mean, there are you know there's almost another counterintuitive thing, Dan. With you know, somewhat having less layers in a sleeping bag keeps you warmer. Why don't you talk a little bit about that because it is counterintuitive and it's kind of a big issue. Yeah, that's a good one actually. That's a good question. So when I am sleeping uh, in the Boundary Waters, whether it's like a hot tent or a cold tent, I I'm usually hoping that my sleeping bag keeps me warm as opposed to lots of layer of clothing. So I'll maybe sleep in long underwear, but that's it. And that's definitely, and that's definitely where to go, right? I'll just tell you that from having camped many times, like less is more because that your sleep bag is meant to keep you warm. And if you have, and I, I've been with people who will have on say, there's like a, a shell, like a, a, a Gore-Tex type shell when they're sleeping, because they want to be, they want every layer on. And they're just kind of holding moisture back and then they're creating, I think, a bigger volume to keep warm. Um, and uh, they just don't sleep that well. And so less is more, uh, you know, do two sleeping bags maybe or one really good sleeping bag and then your you're long, long underwear. But the more layers you have on, um, especially if they have a little moisture, is not good. And never, I would, I would really avoid wearing the same thing to bed that I wore during the day when I was hiking around. You know, if it's if it's just your long underwear, that's maybe okay. But like, definitely don't wear like an like a Gore-Tex pants um, or Gore anything like that. And don't wear like an insulated like shell. You would not want to wear those. You will not be as warm. Although I know people who've done it, and I've seen from experience, you're just not as warm. You know, wear socks, wear a hat. You know, wear. Um, good long underwear if you had to wear maybe a fleece but don't don't be wearing a whole lot of stuff you're gonna you're really gonna be miserable from my experience there's a, a question here on the topic of moisture dan about quinzies do you get moisture in quinzies 
Good question. Uh, you get um, you will you will get condensation that forms in there. It's like little like you, you when you breathe, it when it hits the wall, it will like frost up there, right? And so it's usually not too much of an issue. Um, you know, you you want to have enough room in there that you're not rubbing against the wall, but it's, it's usually not too much of an issue. Now, a lot of times people will have a candle, like a little beeswax candle lit in there, um, say overnight. I don't you don't have them overnight. I just get just not my style. But um, one thing people will do too is once they carve out that Quincy, you can put like a candle in there and that'll warm it above freezing and you'll get kind of a, uh, it, it, it it hardens off the interior, if you will. It, it melts stuff back and then take the candle out, it cools off and it kind of polishes the interior a little bit. Um, but because they, they can even get little, they can get right up to freezing. Like you want to make sure there's not like a little line of stalactite. Like you don't want like, you want ideally pretty convex, concave, excuse me. So you don't want little like things hanging down that like moisture could drip down. But it's usually not a problem. You just carve that away if it happened. You know, Dan, there's a, another interesting comment here about, about carbon monoxide. And maybe you want to uh, just talk about that risk uh, of carbon totally. monoxide and how you deal that's, with that. That's a great question. That's a great question. Everything I've talked about is using firewood or the like, like nothing, just heat. So carbon monoxide gets formed when there's not enough oxygen during combustion. Okay. And so if you have a wood burning stove, uh, if there's not enough oxygen, it just goes out. But if you're using like a propane heater and like you're trying to heat your tent with that or your ice shelter, whatever it might be, if there's not enough oxygen, it'll burn, but it will not burn completely. So it produces carbon monoxide, not carbon dioxide, which is fatal. And you won't even know it's in the room. And and people die in Minnesota, unfortunately, maybe every year someone's dying, sometimes like in like ice shelters, like ice fishing, and because they'll have a little one of those little one pound tanks. So I never use... Um, like I never would heat the inside of a tent with anything other than firewood, um, or maybe there's other wood stuff, I guess, but, um, I would not heat it with like a propane heater. Um, and they make little propane heaters and stuff like that. I would never do that. I have brought along for many years, I brought along a carbon monoxide detector because I was always concerned, could there be carbon monoxide in this thing? And it was always basically zero because we were burning firewood, uh, or we're burning wood. So do not heat your tent with like anything like don't heat it with like propane or white gas or something like that now we sometimes have used a, a jet boil but not really that much inside you have to be very careful because remember you could if you got like a, a a liquid fuel you could spill that stuff and you could be inside of a burning tent like you don't you you really don't want that right so um the bottom line is do not heat your tent with anything other than firewood in my opinion and uh, if you did have to do something like just never have something else on it overnight and and you will sometimes read about people who are ice fishing left a little heater on all night long in their thing and and it wasn't it, it wasn't working right and they die and you just pass out you know so definitely definitely don't use anything other than wood in in, in my opinion it's a good question. Actually. You know, on the this sort of uh, ventilation question, uh, there's a question from Beth here. Do, do you vent the top of a Quincy? Do you have a vent in the top so, of your Quincy? So, you know, if you, uh, I do. So we don't close the door typically. Mm -hmm. And I will poke through with a stick or I will poke like one or two holes for sure in the back that kind of are higher than the back and um, the entrances. So you end up getting ventilation through that thing. So it'll draw because it's warmer in the Quincy, the warm air flows to the top, draws up, and then draws in fresh air from the door. And you actually will know it's working because the inside, you'll look down that Quincy in the morning and there'll be frost all through there. The frost we're talking about will form in there. Not enough to plug it up, but I, I kind of do more holes than, <laughs> than fewer myself. But Quincy's have been used for many years. And again, you're not... You're not you're not combusting anything in there. You don't have like a, you're not you don't run a propane heater in a Quincy, you know. You know, Dan, with your your uh, hot tent there, how much warmer from the ambient temperature can you get it? Good question. So the snow trekker type type tents are going to be warmer, the canvas ones, than the other one. My rule of thumb, it's about seventy degrees 
if it's if you've got a good fire going, it's about 70 degrees warmer. So I had the pictures when it was 40 below air temperature, which is 40 below Celsius and Fahrenheit. Same thing. That's where they cross over. But um, 40 below, and it was about freezing inside, which is not warm, but like it's 70 degrees warmer. It was, in, you know, it felt very warm. And it'd be like being outside today in Minneapolis, I guess a little colder than that. But no, you're very comfortable. And that was the coldest, right? So if it's 20 below, it could be 50 in that tent from my experience. But it, more likely if it's like zero, it's 70 degrees and you're very cozy. And I bring along little chairs typically. And so we're sitting around, we cook our dinner together. Like it's great. I mean, it's the way to go. Great. Maybe, maybe a, a final question about sort of the supplemental stoves. You, you mentioned a jet boil there and, and, and white gas stoves. I mean, jet boils don't work very well at lower temperatures. When when do they not work, Dan? When do they start to peter out a little bit? Yeah, so that's an isopropyl fuel on a blend sometimes. So uh, I don't know the exact temperature, like a white gas one, a liquid gas, like with a um, uh, Dragonfly or MSR stove. I think... Um, those work in colder temperatures for sure. Like if you're going to cook on it, like, and you're going to cold tend it, you want to use liquid fuel probably. But the jet boil, like the, the if you're like what I would do is I had a jet boil, I would keep like the, the small canister, I'd probably keep it inside my shirt, you know, my inner pocket, at least the one I was going to use. Because uh, if it's if it's 20 below, I don't think you're going to get anything out of that. Even at like maybe 10 degrees, I don't know if you get that much out of it. But once you warm it up, then it would work fine. And then we have a, a question uh, here about footwear a little bit. Do you do you do you wear uh, what what footwear do you like uh, like Steger Mucklucks? Do you what what kind of footwear do you use out there? So I don't wear Steger Mucklucks. I know some people do. I've actually my feet don't normally get too cold. So I've always loved the classic Snow Sorel Caribou. I had those for years, and I had that was the thing that burnt up that <laughs> that liner. I've been looking for liners, and maybe it was the pandemic, and there wasn't like supply chain, but I couldn't get replacement liners. So now I bought a pair of Baffins, which are a, a very good boot. Um, but I loved my Sorels, and so if I can get a liner for them, I might go back to them. But Baffins are, are a great boot, and if your feet get cold, people have been along with use a Baffin. It's great. One thing I would shy away from is you might go to a store and they'll have like an insulated boot with insulated in. They're like, oh, it's good to 25 below or something. But it looks kind of like just a little bit big hiking boot, but it's not like a winter boot. Those are not warm enough. And I've had people come up with them and they're like, oh, yeah, the, the, the guy at the store said this is good for 25 below and it's only going to 10 below. It's not warm enough. You need to have something warm and it should have ideally a removable liner. That's almost a must have. So you pull the liner out and dry it. Um, and if you really are concerned, you get two of those. Um two sets or something like that. But being able to pull the liners out and dry them is important, but you need warm boots. Right. Uh, you know, a, a final question here. Do you, Dan, do you lead trips? Do you lead any, any trips? I, you know, I pretty much just lead trips with my friends. Um, a lot of people come up once and then they love it, but they're like, not always back for a second time. It's not everybody's cup of tea, but Beth, I don't, but if, uh, if you have questions, uh, Chris can get, and I, mean, I think it was on the slide. You could send me an email. I can help you plan a trip. And if I have an opening, maybe uh, <laughs> somebody can come <laughs> along. That'd be nice. There we go. Well, uh, we're at the uh, end of our, our time here, Dan. Maybe you want to turn to the slide. We have some events coming up. I oh, want yeah. to make, put things on, on everyone's calendar here. And uh, uh, tomorrow we have a Proof It First Coalition Zoom meeting. It's Friday at noon. Uh, so uh, please join us. We'll drop the, the Zoom link in the, the chat here. So Proof It First is our flagship legislation to, to uh, protect the Boundary Waters, Lake Superior, and all of uh, Minnesota's waters from sulfide mining. And if you're in Ely, Ely tomorrow at 5.30, we have a, a Northwoods conversation in our office there. So you can come to our office in downtown Ely at East 8 uh, Sheridan Street there, right, uh, right across from Brandenburg Gallery, and uh, have some tea or hot chocolate or Minneapolis cider and, and have a, a conversation about um, about the Boundary Waters there. And I, well, I want to put uh, two more things uh, on the calendar. First is on December 13th here, uh, right sure. in, in St. Paul here, we have a, a, a Clean Water Advocacy Day at Summit uh, Brewing. Uh, uh, and come do it. We're gonna we're gonna uh, 
come together in community here with with people who love the boundary waters and 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 uh, advocacy groups are are all welcome please come do it and we'll uh we'll uh work together to uh, uh advocate for protecting the boundary waters and then uh uh looking at head here on february 14th yes valentine's day you can show your love for the boundary waters we'll have a prove it first day at the minnesota capitol so uh so Put that on the calendar. You can uh, show your love for the Boundary Waters on February 14th by coming to the Prove It First uh, rally and um, uh, connect with your legislators on, on that day. So um, I am uh, so grateful that all of you are here and uh, so grateful that all of you love the Boundary Waters. You are the strength of Friends of the Boundary Waters Wilderness and you will protect the Boundary Waters for the next 50 years. So Dan, thank you so much for all that you do. And everyone have a, a great holiday season here. Take care.